Welcome to the first webinar in the spring session of Contemporary Challenges in American Global Law. I'm Leah Wortham, Professor Emerita of Law at the Columbus School of Law of the Catholic University of America. I'm the Catholic University Director of the American Law Program and LLM Program, which Catholic University has cooperated with Jagiellonian University in Krakow, Poland for many years. I will be your moderator. To open, I turn to Louise Leiden, the Executive Director of Development and Alumni Relations for the Columbus School of Law of the Catholic University of America, who will bring greetings from our law school. Thank you, Professor Wortham. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. I want to especially thank Professor Wortham for her leadership, for putting together this particular program and recognize her efforts to foster and cultivate the relationship between uh, the best law school in Poland and the Aguilonian University. She is a uh, emeritus professor, Rhett Ludikowski, the founder of the Catholic Jagiellonian relationship, whom many of you know. Catholic law appreciates this 30 year relationship with the Jagiellonian University. The program and LLM in American law now have more than 2000 US, Polish and other international alumni. The panelists today are superb. They're not only experts in their fields, but they're beloved alumni. Uh, it's been my honor to get to know them. And it's my hope that through these Zoom meetings, we may continue to grow our community by sharing our global experiences that these programs had fostered. Thank you so much for joining us today. We value your participation and hope to see you more often. Back to you, Professor. Thank you, Louise. So now Wojciech Banczyk, coordinator of the American Law School, will welcome you on behalf of Jagiellonian University. Rawrtham, thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, you participants of the series of webinars. It's a great pleasure for me to express on behalf of the Aguilonian University, the great joy that you all joined us in the online meeting, showing your interest in the contemporary challenges in American and global law. We are very happy to observe, again, such a huge audience who shares our passions. Our meeting here allows to hope for many common undertakings in the future. Thus, we look forward that developing cooperation of the Aguilonian University and the Catholic University of America continues even during the difficult pandemic situation. At the same time, this position allows me to present the huge gratitude to all the persons without whom it will never be possible for this event to happen. Again, we are very happy that the transatlantic cooperation continues even without the possibility to meet in person. Uh, to reassume, we are very excited with a new way to learn and to meet together. At the same time, we do hope that sooner or later, we'll all meet in person during our alumni events or other meetings. Thank you. Thank you. This webinar series is indeed, as Louise and Wojciech have said, a team effort which starts with the strong support of Dean Stephen Payne of Catholic University and Dean Jerzy Pichelinski of Jagiellonian University. It draws on the leadership and staff of the Jagiellonian Center for Foreign Law School Cooperation, often referred to by its Polish acronym OXPO, and the Catholic University and Law, and Law School Development and Alumni Relations and Communications Offices, as well as the help as well as the Central University Development Office, which helps us with registration and technology, and our LLM coordinators and LLM graduates, Gaspar Cote and Luke Bartosik. The links for the three remaining webinars in the spring session are available on the series website, as well as recordings for past webinars. We're delighted to have two CUA professors who have taught in the American Law Program in the past, joining us for April 27th and May 12th. On April 27th, Mary Leary will talk about parallels in the hashtag MeToo and hashtag Black Lives Matter movements. And on May 12th, Regina Jefferson will consider United States retirement savings policy through the lens of international human rights policy. Their commenters are distinguished Polish academics whom we are proud are graduates of the International Business and Trade Summer Law Program. Professor Aleksandra Kusturogatka is on the faculty of Nicholas Copernicus University in Turin. Her research focuses in part on the role of non-governmental organizations dealing with democracy and rule of law. So hence, we'll offer an interesting perspective on Professor Leary's talk. Professor Elzbiata Karska from Cardinal Stefan Wyszynski University in Warsaw is an internationally recognized expert in human rights law and will be an excellent commenter for Professor Jefferson. 
In our final webinar on June 5th, we will return to policy and regulation of investment funds with LLM graduate Victor Furman, who, will, who practices law in Stockholm, Sweden, and with comments from CUA JD alum and partner in the Deckert firm, James Catano. We welcome any of you interested to an information session on the LLM program, which will take place on Thursday, April 29th at 6 p.m. Polish time. You can register on the Facebook page, and I think we'll have a chat uh, link to that in the chat, but you can link from the LLM Facebook page. We continue to hope to offer the live LLM in our normal schedule in the fall. That, of course, depends on how health, travel, and border issues evolve over the spring and summer. Hence, the normal timetable for the entrance exam and admission process will be later than usual as we wait to see what is possible. We are pleased that so many of you will qualify for the, uh, with the webinar attendance certificate, which waives the requirement of the entrance exam. So we turn to today's program by CUA L alum Katrina Volskovrona, followed by comments by CUA JD, Judge Diane Kiesel. So Kasha, you can go ahead and um, share your screen. I expect most of you have used Zoom before or a similar video conferencing platform. So you know about typing questions in the chat. I'll be taking questions from the chat and posing them to the speakers. You can type your question directly in the chat. If you prefer, you can click the drop down where it says everyone and go to my name and send to me privately. Or you can send to Luke Bartosik for him to post for you. You also can send a private chat to anyone on the webinar if you see an old friend or a classmate with whom you would like to connect. So in addition to the chat button, you can see a participants button and clicking there lets you see the names of people who are signed on. Unfortunately, the registration software does not recognize some Polish characters. Uh, when you register, it's best if you just use the English character. We apologize if question marks show up in your name. Ms. Volskovrona will speak for about 20 minutes. She'll be followed by a comment from Judge Kiesel, who also will lead off the question and answer period. As I mentioned before, type your question in the chat or send to me, uh, Luke Bartosik, or to Wojtek Banczyk privately. After uh, Ms. Volskovrona answers Judge Kiesel's questions, I'll pose the questions from the chat. The session is being recorded uh, for the first 60 minutes, and that will be posted on CUA's YouTube channel. After the 60 minutes, I will close the formal webinar and the recording will cease. Uh, Ms. Volskovrona and Judge Kiesel have graciously agreed to stay on for up to a half hour so we can take more of your questions. So I encourage any of you who would like to stay on for more questions and discussion to do so. So I'll now briefly introduce our speakers. Katarzyna Volskovrona has worked on the European Union decision-making process and protection of fundamental rights concerning gender-based violence since 2009. She was a member of the Polish government's delegation to the Ad Hoc Committee for Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence. In 2012 to 2014, <clears throat> she was the Poland's legal expert responsible for coordination and ratification of the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, the Istanbul Convention. In her career in Polish public administration, she has worked in the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the Chancellery of the Prime Minister. From 2018 to 2020, she was a secunded national expert for the European Institute for Gender Equality in Vilnius, Lithuania, working in gender-based violence. She received her LLM from CUA in 2005, her Polish master's degree in laws from Warsaw University. The Honorable Diane Kiesel became a judge in 1999 with appointment to the New York City Criminal Court. Since 2004, she has been an acting Supreme Court Justice for the criminal term, the criminal child court that hears serious felony level crimes. Judge Kiesel received her, received her JD from the Columbus School of Law in 1985. She came to law school with an undergraduate degree in communications and English, plus a master's degree in public affairs journalism. She worked as a reporter for several magazines <clears throat> and newspapers prior to coming to law school. And while in law school in our part-time evening division, she was the Washington correspondent for the American Bar Association Journal. After law school, she clerked for two US federal court judges and was an associate for the Wall Street law firm of Cahill, Gordon and Rendell. 
She then moved to becoming an assistant district attorney with the New York County District Attorney's Office, where she prosecuted sex crimes, homicides, major felonies, and police corruption cases. When appointed to the bench, she was deputy chief of the district attorney's child abuse unit. For 15 years, Judge Kiesel sat in the New, York, New York's first integrated domestic violence court in Bronx County, where she presided over criminal, family, and matrimonial cases involving allegations of domestic violence. Since 2018, Judge Kiesel, Kiesel has presided in a felony trial court in Manhattan. Since 1992, Judge Kiesel has been an adjunct professor of law at New York Law School, where she taught legal writing and domestic violence law. Judge Kiesel is the author of two editions of a law school textbook on domestic violence and a book on black civil rights pioneer, Dorothy Bolding Farabee. She is now working on a new book to be published by University of Michigan Press called The Trials of Charlie Chaplin, How the Federal Government and One Woman Drove the Little Tramp from the United States. Judge Kiesel received the law school's Distinguished Public Service Award in October 2020. So Diane, excuse me, Kasha. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to, to be here with you and thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you can see and hear me okay. If not, I please give me a, a wave or a shout and I will try to remedy any sort of technical problems that we might encounter. Um, so uh, thank you again for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here in such esteemed company. Um, I was asked to speak a little bit about the Council of Europe Convention on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women and Domestic Violence, also known as, uh, known as the Istanbul Convention. Um, in the past 20, 30 years, we've really been witnessing the, the, the growing development of the legal framework uh, aimed at uh, counteracting uh, gender-based violence and violence against women. And um, the acceleration of this growth has really been noticed, especially when it comes to the Istanbul Convention. And uh, once it was uh, what led to its adoption and then following its adoption and entering into force, the way that it's pushing the growth of, of, of and the changes in national legislations, but also internationally, is really something that it's that is very interesting to, to bear witness to. Uh, before I get into the details on the convention itself, allow me to um, talk about two, highlight two things, which I think are very important for the, to, to sort of lay the, the context for the Istanbul Convention itself. So I wanted to discuss the fundamental principles of Istanbul Convention and also talk a little bit about where the convention falls within the international or European uh, legal human rights framework. Uh, and let's see if I can change this slide now. Okay, there we go. Uh, so the three sort of core principles uh, which, which the Istanbul Convention and thus most modern international and consequential national legislation on violence against women is based on are the ones that you can see on the screen right now. So the right to safe and life without violence um, is considered to be a fundamental right. This means that the state is obliged to uh, safeguard individuals from violence, even if it's taking place within their um, homes or within their private uh, relationships, the state has the obligation to step in and uh, help and protect the victims. Uh, second, uh, violence against women is uh, structural. Uh, structural. It is systematic. It is. It stems from unequal and discriminatory treatment of women uh, throughout the history, and it's a consequence. It's, it's of this discrimination. Um, and last but not least, domestic violence affects women dis uh, disproportionately. Now, this of course does not mean that women are the only victims of domestic violence. Of, of course, men, uh, non-binary persons fall victim to domestic violence, but it is the fact that. According to research and data, uh, women do constitute the majority of uh, domestic violence victims. So um, those are the core principles that all of the, the convention is based on. It is also worth noting that those quite clear, it seems, and, and perhaps not too um, controversial uh, at first glance uh, statements do seem to be uh, some of the reasons why there is an ongoing sort of backlash or, or, or um, opposition to the convention, which I'm sure we'll get on 
and talk a little bit about later on during uh, today's webinar. Uh, now, in terms of the international structures and how how the convention sort of fits and where it fits, I think it's it's important because we're sort of witnessing a, a, a lot of we're living with so many different international structures and organizations which focus on safeguarding human rights and democracy and the rule of law. So, and they do tend to sort of coexist and intertwine a little bit. But I so before we, we 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 I do wanted to kind of systematically show, and I know most of you probably know this very well, but just to kind of keep <laughs> keep the, the clear clarity uh, and 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 have this understanding, a clear understanding before we step into the, the convention itself. I just wanted to talk about the differences and, and the connections between European Union and Council of Europe. So the EU, as we most of us, and I'm sure all of us well know, is an is a international organization that consists of 27 member states. It was founded on um, common economic and um, political goals. And since the adoption of the Lisbon Treaty 10 years ago, we can see that the, I, the question of fundamental rights uh, has really uh, sort of become much more of a focus with, it, with the integration of, uh, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and, and sort of taking that very important um, piece of legislation as, as part of the, of the binding uh, are key. The fundamental rights issues have really become an integral part within uh, basically all EU policies and are now sort of reaching a, a more and more priority status. And so fundamental rights issues such as uh, combating gender-based violence is now becoming also uh, 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 an issue that is being discussed and, 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 and worked on within the EU structures. And it's important to know that while this work is being carried out, the Istanbul Convention is in a lot of ways guiding the direction of this work. Now, in terms of the, in terms of the Council of uh, Europe, it's, uh, it's an international organization that was founded immediately after, well, a couple of years after the war. It is a much larger organization and consists of 47 member states. All EU member states are also members of the Council of Europe. Um, and the Council of Europe is focused on safeguarding fundamental values. So its most notable achievement is the European Convention on Human Rights, um, the European Court on Human Rights, uh, but the Council of Europe has, uh, within the, its framework, within its structures, there's more than 220 different conven conventions that deal with some aspects of, of, of fundamental rights um, that, uh, that, that, that are enacted or entering in force. So, the Istanbul Convention is one of those additional uh, conventions um, that sort of form the whole framework of this legal uh, legal framework of, of Council of Europe. Um, now, the work on uh, gender-based violence, violence against women, uh, has begun in Council of Europe in the 90s. Uh, there were several different initiatives which uh, led to uh, the adoption in early 2000, 2002. It led to an adoption of a non-binding uh, recommendation of Council of Ministers, which is a body of Council of Europe that consists of all states uh, that are members of, of Council of Europe. Um, so this non-binding recommendations dealt on issues and directions of how women can be better protected against violence. Um, and then were followed up by a very long running awareness raising campaign in all of the Council of Europe, for, in all 47 member states of Council of Europe. Uh, and this campaign and the national reports and studies and survey that kind of fed into it and, 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 and were, were picked up during this time revealed really the magnitude of the problem um, in Europe, as well also as the fact how differently different European states are uh, dealing with issues of, of uh, violence against women and domestic violence. And, and, and so the, the need to kind of have a more harmonized approach uh, to ensure that the victims really do benefit from the protection um, to the fullest extent became quite apparent. 
Um, and so it was decided that uh, that a, a set of it would, that it's 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 necessary to develop a set of comprehensive uh, standards to to prevent and to combat domestic violence and violence against women. And in December 2008, a, a working party, a, an expert group was set up by the Committee of Ministers and was given a mandate to work on and draft um, convention uh, in the field of, uh, of combating violence against women and domestic violence. And this committee consisted of experts and representatives of all 47 Council of Europe member states. Um, but also besides the, represent the government representatives and practitioners who dealt with victims of violence on a daily basis, there were also uh, representatives of different, um, uh, different NGOs, different international organizations, uh, such as the European Union, um, and, and representatives of states which were not part of, um, of, uh, of the Council of Europe. And so after two years, the, uh, the text of, and tumultuous discussions, um, the text was finally agreed upon and, and, and finalized. And uh, in uh, 10 years ago, almost to the day, on the 7th of April, 2011, uh, the convention was adopted by Committee of Ministers and uh, then opened for signature in May um, of 2011 in Istanbul, uh, Turkey, hence the Istanbul Convention as the sort of working title uh, of of, of this convention. Um, the, the threshold for the convention to come into force was 10 ratifications by 10 uh, uh, state parties. And that happened with the ratification by Andorra in 2014. So only, um, only really three years for, to get the free ratifications, which is actually quite quick. Um, and the convention entered into force in August, 2014. So uh, at this moment, uh, only two of the 47 member states of Council of Europe are, uh, have not signed the convention, and that's Russia and Azerbaijan. Um, 33 countries have uh, signed and ratified, while 13 countries have signed but yet have not finalized the, the ratification process, or it's either ongoing, or there's some hesitancy in a couple of states, but generally most most uh, uh, most countries are are on their way to to ratify the convention as we speak. Um, this is a very interesting moment because uh, only very recently, a week or two ago, really, uh, we had the first instance where a country that previously signed and ratified the convention decided to withdraw from the convention. So um, and such in 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 uh, and at the, at the end of March, Turkey has made a decision to withdraw for, from the convention, and this decision and the withdrawal be, will become uh, uh, finalized and formal and official in July of this year. Uh, the con the convention is open for signature to all countries, also non Council of Europe member states. Uh, as well as to European Union, and the European Union has made the decision to sign the convention uh, and has done so in 2016. And now the process of acceding to the convention is ongoing. And if the current European Commission gets its way, uh, it is considered to be a priority. So there is a, there is a chance that the, the accession of the European Union to the convention will happen within the next couple of years. Now, why is this convention so amazing? And why are we speaking about it? And why, why is it considered to be the golden standard by the, by the UN? Um, I think that the, the most uh, innovative thing about the convention is that it has a, a holistic approach. It really um, presents a very full roadmap of how to approach uh, combating and preventing gender-based violence and domestic violence. It, it, it has a comprehensive guide from A to Z of what a state can do in order to aim towards uh, guaranteeing protection for victims of, of gender-based violence and domestic violence. Um, the scope of the convention is, uh, uh, is quite large. It relates to all forms of violence against women. It relates to all uh, women and girls uh, who are victim to, to, to violence, uh, but it also may be applied to all other victims of domestic violence. Um, it also is in effect uh, in the times of war and in the times of peace. 
Um, now there are four sort of major pillars that 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 are sort of constitute this this comprehensive approach. So the first is the pillar of prevention. Uh, the convention um, very uh, comprehensively uh, sort of outlines what sort of measures a member state, a state party may um, may uh, introduce in order to try to prevent um, gender-based violence before it happens. So there's uh, there's provisions on educations that should take place in uh, in schools and universities. There's provisions on training of professionals. There's provisions of awareness raising of general general society, general community. There's provisions that um, that deal with preventive programs. Uh, there's provisions that outline that you need to have financial resources because you cannot uh, implement many measures if you don't have the money to, to back it up. Um, and there's also provisions on data ga uh, gathering because quite obviously we need to sort of in order to make sure that what we're implementing and the policies and the measures that we're, we're putting in actions are working, we need to back them up with data. We need to be checking whether that's the right direction where we're going. So the data gathering element is quite important as well. In terms of, pros uh, in terms of prosecution, in its substantive law part, the convention deals with uh, a whole number sort of uh, outlines a whole number of different um, acts that should be criminalized by, uh, by the state parties. This includes physical violence, uh, psychological, sexual, uh, and it's worth noting that the sexual violence here has the element of consent. So a sexual assault can, is committed where there's a lack of consent. This is a, a sort of a very innovative approach to many uh, in terms of, you know, national approaches that you can see up to, up until now. Um, but it also obliges state parties to criminalize the female genital mutilation, um, forced marriages, stalking. So there's a whole number of, of different offenses. Interestingly enough, and this shows how um, how really how 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 much we are in the process of everything developing. Um, what we fought off, the offenses we fought off, uh, you know just 12 years ago, not that long ago, um, did not include some of the offenses and some of the, the, the forms of gender-based violence that you can see that have developed now. There's really no mention of cyber violence against women in the convention. There's really no mention of femicide. So there's, there's, there's some, you know, there's room for improvement in the future should there be a decision to make some sort of amendments or do additional protocols, because as we see, uh, gender-based violence and violence against women is sort of a phenomenon that we continue to know more about and it continues to develop in the directions that we wouldn't have thought uh, about, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, unfortunately. So um, the third pillar that's uh, that's extremely important and I think possibly one of the most important is obviously the protection pillar. And here again, the, um, the convention very, um, very uh, comprehensively outlines measures which uh, the member states should implement in order to ensure the protection for victims of violence. So we have different uh, questions relating to obligations on uh, access to support services, to specialized services, um, specialized assistance, to shelters, to helplines. Um, uh, we also have a number of different provisions regarding procedural rules. So how to make sure that the victim feels protected within the procedural, uh, within the, the proceedings, the criminal proceedings or the civil proceedings that are ongoing. Um, and also different protection measures such as risk, risk assessments, risk management, uh, and protective orders, which I will expand on a little bit in a moment. Um, another very innovative approach and measures taken in the convention is the fact that it highlights integrated policies. So it, it really highlights the fact that you need a coordinated multi-agency approach. It's not just one man for itself. It needs to be several different institutions working together on a problem in order to try to solve it efficiently. It also highlights the possibility to really work with other actors um, that are not necessarily representative of the government. So, you know, NGOs, um, uh, private companies, media, they also can have a role uh, in trying to counteract uh, violence against women and gender-based violence. 
And the final thing I wanted to mention, uh, which is an important element in, in the convention, is the monitoring and the reporting mechanism. So obviously, you know, when you write a, a legal act and you kind of put it into place, you need to kind of check how it's working out, if, if, how it's being implemented, whether it's being implemented correctly, but also you need to see whether what you fought and, and how you envisioned a provision will work is actually working that way in, in, in practice. So um, this into, there is a, the, the convention sets up an um, independent group of experts called Grevio, who uh, are in charge of monitoring and sort of reporting back on how the state parties are in fact uh, filling out their obligations and then um, also giving reports of what's working, what's not working, what could be changed, which in the long run uh, should solve as a sort of uh, you know check on, on how we can make the convention better. Do we need another protocol? Do we need to include some things? Do we need to change some things? Now, I, I said that I wanted to circle back to uh, order of protections. Uh, I wanted to choose one thing that, uh, that was uh, sort of, you know, really showed the innovative nature of the convention and also could tie maybe to the US experience a little bit because certainly from the Polish perspective, oftentimes the, the idea of a restraining order is something that you see in basically every single, uh, you know, cop movie. Um, uh, so, so it speaks to, <laughs> to a lot of people, but it's, uh, and it's something that it's becoming more and more, and of course, you know, has existed in, 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 in European legislation and Polish legislation as well, but here the convention sort of, uh, puts in a new twist. So, um, there's, there's obviously in, in uh, instances of violence, there's a need to, uh, to, 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 to have means to grant protection in the situations of immediate danger, right? And that's the, 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 the reasoning behind any sort of emergency bearing orders or protection orders. And so the provisions that the, uh, that the convention foresees um, do specify on, on that member states that the state parties need to set up this sort of this sort of uh, measures in order to to ensure this protection but besides the the, the normal sort of uh, you know protection orders that can be set within an ongoing criminal procedure or you know by the court the con uh, the convention also foresees for um for uh, an obligation of providing for a protection order which can be issued ex parte and with an immediate effect. And then the way that, um, that many member states have decided to implement this in their, national, um, in their national provisions, and please see that this is sort of, this sets a general requirement, but doesn't tell you exactly how you're supposed to do it. So member states need to sort of think about how it works in their national policies and, 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 and try to figure out for, for, for a solution. And so the solution that is being heavily relied on is something that was actually developed in Austria in the 90s, which is the uh, police protection expulsion order. So it means that um, it allows for poli police officers who come and interview on an incident of violence and report have an intervention are being called into an incident of violence to make a decision that the situation is dangerous enough for the victim that the perpetrator or alleged perpetrator needs to be taken out of the situation, needs to be expelled from the uh, from the place of residence, and the the victim and the possible children that might be in stay there while he needs to sort of be out of the picture for a couple of of, of days. Usually, it's it's a week or two. Um, very recently, uh, this sort of um, uh, this sort of uh, provisions we see in Austria, Slovenia, the Netherlands, Spain, and very recently, just a couple of months ago, it was also introduced in Poland. And the way it works in Poland is uh, that if the police come and find that the uh, perpetrator poses immediate danger to the victim, um, they can ask him to vacate the premises and he needs to step away and, and go somewhere else for 14 days. He also receives a temporary restraining order to the premises, not to the victim, to the premises. So he cannot be sort of, you know, moved to the entrance of the house, for example, and stay there for, to the basement. He needs to be away from the premises for 14 days. Now, this 14 days allow for the victim to um, take the time to maybe file for a civil uh, uh, expulsion order civil protection order, 
uh, if during the intervention a child was present in the in 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 the residence, the, um, the information about the order is sent to the family court, and so then the family court ex officio kind of makes a decision whether there is a need to make the order longer or or whether it's fine. There's just those fourteen days. Um, it's it's a very novel experience for for the Polish law and we're just going to find out how it's work how it's going to work this is obviously I, I don't have any data on how it's working out so far because it's quite fresh but it's a very important uh, important change because up until now you could take the 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 perpetrator and arrest him or hold him for 48 hours if he presented direct immediate danger right now if there's just immediate danger without the directness so it's a less lessened threshold, he can be actually taken out of the picture for 14 days. And um, there is there is this approach where, you know, it's not the, the victim and the, the, with the children, you know, running away to a shelter. It's the, 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 the perpetrator, the offender who's supposed to kind of, you know, unproof his life or uh, unroot his life for a couple of days rather than the other way around. Um, and it's, 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 it's certainly uh, something that that makes this uh, that makes this convention extremely uh, victim centric. Um, now, I could talk about this very very long, but I think I'm already over the time limit, so uh, I uh, do, do apologize for that. Uh, I will be very happy to to continue in the in the Q and A uh, section after uh, Judge uh, Diane Kiesel. But if you uh, if you, before I finish, if you do like to find out a little bit more about the convention. Uh, I highly recommend you go to the Council of Europe site of the convention. Um, and also, if you would like to know a little bit more about different approaches to combating gender-based violence within the EU, um, I uh, highly like to recommend the reports made by the European Institute for Gender Equality, which is a research institute, which uh, has done a lot of research and a lot of different uh, studies on the subject. So thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to discussing a little bit more after uh, the presentation of the EU, uh, US experience. Sorry, thanks. Diane? Yes, certainly. Thank you very much, Kasia, for an excellent, excellent presentation. And while I was listening to it, it reminds me of all of the similar challenges we've had in the United States in enacting something similar to the Istanbul Convention, which is the Violence Against Women Act. The Violence Against Women Act was uh, uh, introduced way back in 1995 by then uh, Senator uh, Joe Biden, who, as you all know, is now our president. And he considers this one of his uh, most important uh, legislative acts during the uh, 30 years or so that he was in the Senate. Essentially, what the Violence Against Women Act does, like the convention, is it seeks to, unif uh, to make uniform what had previously been uh, 50 separate uh, statutes and rules regarding domestic violence, because uh, in the United States, criminal law and uh, the law of personal injury is determined state by state. There is no, uh, there is not, when it comes to what we consider uh, local crimes. So what the Violence Against Women Act uh, did is first of all, uh, on the issue of orders of protection, it made sure that an order of protection issued say in New York would be given full faith and credit in all of the other states because people move around a lot and particularly if a victim of domestic violence is fleeing a violent situation uh, the violence against women act ensures that if she does flee the jurisdiction that as long as the perpetrator had notice and an opportunity to be heard when it came to the issuance of that order of protection that it would be given full faith and credit in her new jurisdiction it also, like the Istanbul Convention, uh, 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 funneled a lot of money initially, uh, initially about a billion and a half dollars 
to all kinds of holistic approaches, training for police departments, training for uh, judges, and uh, setting up or offices of uh, domestic violence services in uh, all of the all of the fifty states. But you know, it remains such an intractable problem in this country as it is worldwide. Uh, just so you understand the extent of it, uh, three women a day are murdered in the United States by their intimate partners. 92% of those murders involve guns. Now, the United States has a, because of the Second Amendment and our own history, it has a very strong gun culture that, of course, doesn't exist in Europe, but it is um, a major factor here in the deaths of, uh, of women due to domestic violence. And of course, uh, as the uh, Istanbul Convention notes, it is not simply a woman problem, although studies and statistics show 85 to 90 percent uh, at least of domestic violence uh, victims are women in heterosexual relationships. Uh, domestic violence impacts the homosexual community, the lesbian community, the transgendered community. Again, statistically, it's really uh, eyebrow and hair raising. 35% um, of all women in the world maintain that they have been victims of domestic violence. 21% of male homosexuals, 35% of lesbians, and 35% of transgender people around the world have had some experience, unfortunately, with domestic violence. In America, 1.4 million people a year are stalked. Uh, stalking is all, often a precursor uh, to domestic violence. Uh, to more to violence beyond just being followed around, which in and of itself can be unnerving. And about a million of those persons stalked are, are women. Getting back very quickly to the, to the Violence Against Women Act, besides just making orders of protection uh, viable across state lines, it created new federal crimes of crossing state lines to violate orders of protection. It created very strong restrictions on gun ownership by persons uh, convicted of domestic violence. And as I said, provided a number of grants uh, for that purpose. I'll finish up by saying um, in 1995, or excuse me, 1994, when this law was uh, initially enacted, it seemed to be uh, something for which everyone was on board. It has been reauthorized. It has to be periodically reauthorized in 2000, 2005, and then 2013. And now it's kind of stalled. And it has become stalled due to certain um, political issues. Those issues uh, including that uh, conservatives feel that it is, it is now reaching too many people. Initially, of course, it reached uh, our traditional view of what an intimate partner is. Well, now our view of, uh, of relationships has grown and changed over the years. Relationships now include same-sex couples. Relationships now include transgendered persons. And it's hard for uh, the conservative element in our country to accept that. And that has uh, contributed to stalling with uh, reauthorization. All right. And um, uh, finally, I just uh, close with the fact that um, uh, despite all of this, uh, you know, we're still talking about 1.3, uh, I'm sorry, one in three women getting murdered uh, in this country. And a final tidbit in the United States on orders of protection, I don't know if you have this in the, in the European Union, but we can now issue orders of protection for pets, for companion animals. And while that may sound silly, it's not. Studies have shown that women are reluctant to go to shelter if they have to leave their pet behind that uh, batterers will often use threats of killing the family pet or taking him away from children as a way to keep victimized women in the home so they won't leave. So um, a good number of states, including New York, now allow uh, orders of protection for pets. And I have issued many myself 
on behalf of kittens. And I think I did a tortoise once and maybe a bird. So uh, on that note, uh, I, I finish. Uh, and um, I do have a question or two uh, for you, Kaja, if you're prepared to answer. And I guess the question I thought, because I've thought about the political considerations in the United States, what political considerations would cause a, um, a, a country to sign the convention but not ratify it? What's the thinking there, if you can explain that? Thank you very much, Diane. Yes, um, I, I, before I answer this question, I actually wanted to say that pets are also taken into account in the new um, oh, law that we have here. Not maybe, perhaps as slightly differently <laughs> than, than in the US, but it is um, when the person is supposed to leave the, the house, they should take uh, their possessions that can come back once with the police to take the stuff that they need to sort of function. But the interesting thing is that it was taken into account that you know someone might come in and be like, I want the dog, while the dog is the most beloved pet of the children and it's being done basically in malice. So in, in reference to pets, but also to, to physical belongings, if someone, if there's any person that lives in the house that says, no, this is not yours, this is ours, um, they cannot take uh, that that pet or you know possession with them. So um, it's a little more, a little less sort of automatic. It's treating pets more like a possession than than an entity that needs protection. But uh, but it's at least taken into account as you know the practical in practical in life. <laughs> this is very much a, an issue quite often. Um, but but getting to your question, yes the. Um, well, I mean, there, there's a couple. I, to be fair, with all the 20, 220 different conventions that the uh, Council of Europe has, not all of them have been ratified by every single um, member state of the Council of Europe. I mean, it's, uh, it is a ratification, it's a difficult process. So um, signing a convention usually is, is, a, is a political um, signal that uh, what's in the convention is, uh, is something that the country agrees with or the, the organization like European Union, something that they agree with, something that they would like to work towards, uh, something that they uh, think that, uh, that is correct. And, 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 and so it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a political um, signal. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when you ratify, you, you formally oblige yourself, you formally say, yes, I will do it. So, so it's, it's sort of uh, like an engagement of sorts, uh, it, you know, you're, you're, you're a promise ring in a way, but, uh, but uh, there's, depending on, on, on member states, uh, even signing sometimes can be a, a, a quite a strong political signal. Uh, but that's of course always dependent on the national legal, you know, um, elements of what it, how, how ready you have to be in order to sign. And uh, but generally, the 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 you know, very often um, the countries tend to sign a convention and then quite a long wait quite a long time for the ratification. Sometimes they sign and never ratify. Um, it's uh, it's it's very much a political sort of uh, decision and, and process in that respect. <clears throat> a, a, a quick follow up, if I may. Uh, once a state ratifies, how long after that does it generally take, if you can speak in generalities, for that state to then implement laws that will uh, follow what they've ratified, if you will? Okay, so this is again quite quite a, a national specific situation because there are some states uh, that um, sign and ratify without having anything in place or you know having a lot of gaps <laughs> in implementation, and so they're sort of we're doing it, we're going to do it, we're we're ready. And they sign and they ratify, and there is still so many things that they need to do, and they work towards it. 
um, this is an interesting, I mean, you know, it's, it's again, a strong political statement, but then when a report, a monitoring report comes, uh, a country finds itself with a lot of sort of, you have to do this and this and this. So, um, so I, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a d difficult, I don't know if it's the best uh, way to go, I wouldn't recommend it, but there's some other countries, for example, that can't sign or ratify before they have absolutely everything that's in the convention already on the national level. So this is, for example, uh, Ireland. Uh, Ireland could not sign nor ratify until they had a fully implemented uh, system in their national system. Um, and so they went and then made a national program of uh, working towards the implementation. And, and after they implemented everything, they signed and ratified. Germany signed, but couldn't ratify until they had everything in. So again, it was a, a, at least, I think, four or five years before they were able to. In case of Poland, um, we actually were quite quick because we didn't uh, sign immediately when the convention was open for signature in 2011. Uh, we uh, signed only in 2014. Uh, if, yeah, well, actually 20, hold on, I'm sorry. Now I'm thinking back 2012, <laughs> I apologize. And then we ratified in 2015. So uh, it took us about two years between the signature and the ratification. But to be fair, um, we already, when we were signing, we had quite a lot of things in our uh, legislation that we felt fit the standard of the convention. Um, and right now, even though we're after uh, the, the ratification, we ratified in 2015, so it's, it's coming up on five years, well, actually past five years, um, there's still a couple of gaps that we haven't implemented. So as an example, uh, the, the, the definition of a relationship, something that you, you, you touched on. Um, in the convention, there is a, a definition of what is considered domestic violence. And it very clearly states that it's, it's instances of violence between current or former partners, whether they are living together or apart. According to the Polish domestic violence law, uh, protection against domestic violence is granted to current or former partners, but only if they're living together. If they are living apart and they're former partners, for example, they're divorced already, uh, and they're living apart and, the, and there's still some sort of domestic violence happening because I don't know, you know, they have a child and they share a dog. I mean, you know, there's, it's not like you divorce someone and you lose touch completely, but quite often you have to still coexist. And so it, it gives that, that, that uh, space for, 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 you know, for violence to occur. Um, if, they're not, if they're not living together, they're not protected. They can't be uh, filled, you know, they, they're not within the scope of the protection for, for domestic violence in Poland. So this is still something that we need to kind of work on and, and, and try to modify to, to make sure that we expand the scope to up to the standards of the convention. Great. Thank you. So we have about eight minutes before we end the recording and we just move right on with questions and answers. Before we, um, before I pose a couple of questions I've gotten, I want to first recognize that um, some people in the audience, Catherine Klein is with us, who is our director of our families in the law clinic. Uh, one of the things that Catholic is very proud of is that we had one of the first domestic violence clinics in the United States. We've had um, a domestic violence based clinic for our students since the 1970s. And uh, so many, many of our students are graduates of that clinic and uh, many people, many clients in the District of Columbia have, you know, have been our clients. I also want to recognize George Garvey, who's the founder of the American Law Program, the LLM, who's one of, one of our faithful attendees. And we have two of our American Law Program faculty, at least, I may miss someone, but Rick Pelt Steele is with us and Mary Graw Leary, who will be our speaker next time. So thanks very much to them for joining. So I think in this, uh, in the questions, actually of uh, the questions who've come, some of the questions that have come in thus far, um, there's sort of two parallel tracks I think we may go down. One is the political track of the, you know, why do court countries ratify, why they hesitate to ratify, and Diane's uh, parallel to the to VAWA was, was so important. I hadn't even really thought about that. It is exactly directly parallel. It is that, well, it's, it's that federal state relationship is very similar to the relationship uh, of signatories to the Council of Europe Instruments. And so there's sort of the political track, but then there's also the substantive track. 
like what really works because after all um you know the point of all this is to make people's lives better <laughs> stop having people get killed you know make more peaceful homes for children you know make people not be afraid so i think there are um you know, a variety of questions we may talk and I'll get you both thinking about, because I think we'll also do a little bit because you both are people with such incredible experience, but what works, you know, what's really made a difference in people's lives. And I do have a question in the chat that goes to that. This question is, uh, especially in often in, you know, um, as populism rises, there's this notion, we just make the penalties stricter and stricter, then we're gonna deter crime. You know, this logic that that's an important way to do it. Uh, when you look at domestic violence, and this could be a very um, arguable proposition, it's, a, it's in a way maybe a different kind of defendant, uh, you know, you probably have statistics about how often people who are defendants in domestic violence are also perpetrators of other kinds of crimes, but presumably maybe some aren't. So what are your opinions or your experience about how uh, the importance of penalties and deterrence, the uh, importance there's on the one hand, as we've been talking about protection orders that pull people out of the family and the relationship to um, custody and other other issues, but on the criminal side of it, um, you know, what do you think matters? I mean, you know, how does this, and maybe even the broader question, what does deter people in the end? And I suppose then you can go to broader questions of treatment and intervention. So uh, I'll start with uh, Kasha and then turn to Diane, because I, and we'll probably run a little bit over two o'clock for the recorded part, but when we finish this question, then we'll, you know, we'll just keep right going, but we'll end the recording. So Kasha, if you want to start and then we'll turn to Diane. Sure, yes, thank you, Professor. Um, so as a starting point, I need to say that in the convention, it doesn't say what sort of penalties are supposed to be implemented. So it's really left up to the state parties to decide whether they want to go towards um, putting someone in jail, making them pay, you know, it's it's not it's something that's that's really supposed to be solved on the on the national level. It just says that parties need to make sure that this and this is criminalized or this and this is penalized. Um, from and so I, I'll move to my sort of national experience. <laughs> Um, and 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 see what 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 we found here, what works here. So, um, in terms of the the crimes that are usually um, uh, sort of uh, prosecuted when it comes to domestic violence, it's, it's a particular uh, crime called uh, abuse, um, maltreatment uh, within the the Polish criminal code. Usually, most uh, most domestic violence cases are tried under this crime. Um, and uh, very often people get uh, sort of probational sentences. So they get, you know, a couple of, of, of years uh, in, of probation and then, you know, should they go and, 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 and do something bad again, that this becomes an actual sentence in an actual prison. Um, it, I, I don't have the data on me to tell you exactly how well it works. Uh, I can find it if someone's very interested <laughs> to know, and I'll be very happy to share afterwards. Um, but it's important to say that um, it is a tendency that 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 this not, not doesn't necessarily always works. Um, what we have found worked uh, is uh, perpetrator programs. Uh, within our domestic violence law, we have uh, introduced, which was first introduced in 2005, and then we had a, um, a, a, a sort of amendment in 2011, I think, 2010 or 2011. And so this new approach where we have this uh, approach of working with the family, this blue card procedure where we have a multi-agency uh, approach of, of working with the victim or the perpetrator and trying to find solutions in cases of domestic violence that don't always have to immediately be criminalized because that's another thing. Our definition of domestic violence in Poland, domestic violence is not criminalized. We have acts that can constitute domestic violence that are criminalized, but not domestic violence as a such. We don't have a domestic violence, uh, you know, as 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 a, one single provision. Uh, so within this law, we have we have 
uh, this perpetrator uh, correctional programs, and uh, there has been monitoring of how much reoffending happens after such a program comes, and and it's it's quite low. So it does show that um, that if the perpetrator is willing to work uh, to try to work on 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 their you know on their well anger issues mostly, but I mean whatever issues may be as the additional cause for the violence, um, that usually uh, actually is successful. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I, I fully answered the question. I hope I, I may be an element of it. If I knew the whole answer, I would hope that we would solve the, <laughs> the problem, but, right. um, but, uh, but that's my two cents. And I'm very, I'm very interested to, to hear the, the Diane's perspective here as a, as a practitioner, I'm obviously. A little, so. I'm a little shocked at this because um, uh, a number of years ago, I'd say probably about 15 years ago in the Bronx, uh, Bronx County, where I sat for a long time, it's a very poor community. And uh, we did a study in the misdemeanor court, which is the low level court, the domestic violence court, where the crimes were menacing, threatening, harassing, um, attempted assaults. And we did a two year study on uh, sentencing people to what we call batterers intervention programs. And we found absolutely no statistical correlation between whether they went to this program or whether they just got an order of protection in terms of reoffending. And studies in this country have not been terribly successful in proving that batterers intervention programs prevent uh, recurrence. And this is a really thorny issue in the United States right now, because when I started out in the domestic violence court, the, the, the word was accountability, accountability, accountability. And the sense was that these crimes were never taken seriously. Batterers could injure the entire family and they never went to jail. So there was a real sense that they should be going, they should be accountable through the penal system. And now, of course, in this country, there's a, been a complete turnaround, which is a, a, a sense that there are too many people incarcerated in America, and we need to be looking for other solutions. And I think the issue of domestic violence is a very, I don't know what the answer is in terms of what sanction stops it. You know, you also have this other issue, and you may want to speak to this after we go off camera, Kaja, which is, the recalcitrant victim. You know, we very often, a, a, a victim of domestic violence will call 911 when she's being beaten and she's being afraid, but once the police take them away and she's had time to think about it, and either the children are crying to get him back or she needs him back because he pays the rent, or whether she loves him or whether he's calling her up from prison, threatening her or sweet talking her, who knows, but very often we have women who do not want to go forward and press charges. And there's been a real debate about whether prosecutors' offices go forward without her. And that's been a big, uh, uh, you know, a big discussion in this country for a long time. Well, thank you so much. We're going to close the formal recorded part. We always have much more to discuss in the next half hour. Uh, 